Welcome back to Falcon Physician Review's online review for USMLE Step 1. This is Microbiology Module 4. We're going to be talking about toxins. This is the second in a series of bacterial pathogenesis modules. We're going to give you a long list of toxins to go through. You'll need to get your pencils out to memorize these lists because they're frequent targets on USMLE Step 1. Welcome to Module 4 for Microbiology, the online review for Falcon Physician Reviews for USMLE Step 1. In this module, we're going to talk about toxins. Now, toxins are a favorite testing subject for USMLE Step 1. Unfortunately, it's a long list. Things that you need to remember are which bug makes which toxin for which disease and how it works. Now, that may seem simple or overwhelming. We'll try to go through it piece by piece, and I'll tell you which things to focus on. The functions of toxins include inhibiting protein synthesis. You have neurotoxins, which attack neural tissue. You can increase the stimulation of cyclic AMP. Those are usually enterotoxins. You can use a toxin to kill or destroy cells. And you have endotoxin imitators. There are only a finite number of exotoxin producers, and this list is something you'll need to refer to in your book. Key ones are Staph aureus, Group A strep, Carinibacterium, Clostridium, Shigella, some of the E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Bordetella. These are important to remember and I'd memorize this list. And then I'd go from that list and remember which toxin each one eliminates. Exotoxins. Most exotoxins are AB toxins and they come with two subunits. They have an A or active subunit, which is the business end of the toxin, and they have the B or binding subunit, which helps target it to the specific tissue. The binding target, as shown here in this figure, binds to the cell surface, allows the toxin to be taken into the cell where the active target, where the active subunit does its damage and causes its problems. There are a host of ADP riboslating toxins, each which either increases cyclic AMP, changes EF2 or stops protein synthesis, or has another effect which helps the bacteria elicit its disease. There's a list here of bacteria along the left. Some things to highlight include Vibrio cholera, its cholera toxin increases cyclic AMP, and that's how it causes its watery rice water diarrhea. But C. botulinum, or Clostridium botulinum, has its C2 enterotoxin, which is not the botulinum neurotoxin. When we go over botulinum and Clostridia, you'll find that they have a lot of different toxins. So does Cornerinibacterium diphtheria, lots of different toxins. We're going to try to eliminate, we're going to try to elaborate each of them. Toxins that alter adenylate cyclase, or G-protein activity, are important, and there's only a number of them. The Bordetella pertussis toxin has an adenylate cyclase toxin, which increases cyclic AMP, and the pertussis toxin also increases cyclic AMP, but takes down the GI subunit of cyclic GMP. Bacillus anthracis has the edema factor, which increases cyclic AMP. Most of these have a similar effect, where they increase the, the fluid and electrolyte output of a cell. That's how it causes edema in different body tissues and that's how it causes diarrhea with ETEC and Vibrio cholera. This figure merely demonstrates how cyclic AMP is upregulated by cholera toxin or pertussis toxin. You can see the cholera toxin attaches to the adenylate cyclase active molecule, whereas the pertussis toxin inhibits the dephosphorylation of cyclic AMP. This little mnemonic of CAMP helps you remember the toxins that affect cyclic AMP and upregulate it. C is for cholera, A is for bacillus anthracis, E is the LT toxin of E. coli, and P is pertussis. Neurotoxins and metalloprotease toxins include Clostridium botulinum, the botulinum toxin. This is key. Uh, it's what people use for Botox. The toxin blocks acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction, that causes flaccid paralysis and not so many wrinkles. Clostridium tetani has a tetanus toxin, which is also tetanospasmin, which blocks glycine release of proteolysis of synaptobrevin. This is an inhibitory neuron and it causes a spastic paralysis. So Clostridium botulinum causes a flaccid paralysis. Clostridium tetani causes a, a spastic paralysis. In Bacillus anthracis, there's a lethal factor, which uh, protease like above, but it's an unknown target. This next slide talks about enterotoxins. I'm basically going to take them into two groups. You have them in your book for reference. 
The first group is what blocks protein synthesis by targeting the 60S ribosomal unit. The two members of this family include the Shigella toxin and the Shiga-like toxin in the SLT of EHEC, or enterohemorrhagic E. coli. The second group is quite numerous. All of these cause destruction of cells or water and electrolyte dysregulation in the gastrointestinal epithelium by many different mechanisms. So these are things that are all going to cause diarrhea, and you're going to want to be familiar, at least have a passing familiarity with each. Endotoxin is different from exotoxins. Endotoxin is a name given for lipopolysaccharide, and this is found in the gram-negative cell wall of the bacterial outer membrane. Peptidoglycan and lipotocoic acids from gram-positive bacteria have weak endotoxin-like action. So the bacterial cell envelope or cell wall components are different between the two of them, and they're not proteins or enzymes. What you'll find is that gram-negative bacteria elicit this robust immune response, or this robust inflama inflammatory response, just by account of their lipopolysaccharide. Endotoxin does a specific set of cascades when it comes into contact with the body. It starts nonspecific non inflammation. LPS binds protein and LPS, and they both bind to CD14 on macrophages, and this stimulates the release of three factors, TNF-alpha, IL-1, and then either IL-6 or IL-8. What this does, what the macrophages release products do, is they increase vascular permeability, and they activate acute phase response proteins and platelet activating factor. This then causes endothelial damage, and that activates the coagulation cascade, and can cause DIC, or diffuse in intravascular coagulation. In addition to nonspecific inflammation incited by LPS, you'll get complement activation. LPS acts as a B-cell mitogen to kind of ramp up the humoral immune response. And it acts as an adjuvant, which basically primes your immune system to be on the lookout for new antigens in the form of bacteria. There are exotoxin imitators, which is what we see in the toxic shock syndrome toxin. As you see here in this figure, endotoxin is composed of lipid A. It therefore can activate macrophages, activate complement through the alternative pathway, and it activates Hageman factor. This third row shows all the intermediates, all the intermediaries which cause the problems. IL-1 gives you a fever. Tumor necrosis factor gives you hemorrhagic shock or tissue necrosis. Nitric oxide can give you systemic hypotension or shock. C3A gives you hypotension and edema. C5A will activate neutrophils. And Hageman Clinical features of septic shock is what you get when you get a lot of endotoxin. So you get hypotension, or tissue pooling of fluids. You have disseminated intravascular coagulation. You have a fever. And then you don't, you're not able to perfuse your oxygen. You're not able to perfuse your tissues enough. And so you start to lose organ production. You get multi-system organ failure. And you can die up to 75% of the time. This is why lipid A is toxic because it can initiate this whole cascade of features which can eventually lead to death. Chronic inflammation can be detrimental, uh, and the immune system sometimes, in its response to bacteria, can cause problems. Chronic infections or persisting bacterial remnants can cause a granul granulomatous inflammatory response that damages tissues. Classic examples of granulomatous bacteria include tuberculosis, leprosy, and the spirochete syphilis, or the spirochete that causes syphilis. You can also get autoimmunity, which gives you rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis and streptococcal disease. Opportunistic infections are where a normal host flora, which normally resides on our body, causes disease because the host doesn't have a competent immune system. These people are at increased risk for very serious diseases. Examples include in the skin, when you have Staph aureus, in an immunocompromised person can cause acute endocarditis. So you've got somebody who's a drug user, they get the Staph aureus through the skin into the veins, and then you're in trouble. Staph epidermidis and propionic bacteria of acnes can cause the same problems. In the intestine, you can get bacteroides if they replicate enough, you can cause an abdominal abscess. And the same thing with endobacteriaceae in a low number. There are opportunists in the environment, these are diseases we can catch from the air, the water, the soil, or the food. A hospital is a great place to get sick. You can get nosocomial infections with staph, candida, E. coli, Klebsiella, and Pseudomonas. What we do is we take people, we get them 
in an immunocompromised state, and then we expose them to pathogenic bacteria by transferring from patient to patient. Let's do a couple questions. Endotoxic shock is associated with septicemias caused by. So now we have endotoxin, and so we need to look for gram-negative bacteria, because that's, those are the bacteria that have LPS. So A is a gram-positive, Staph aureus is a gram-positive organism. B, Neisseria meningitidis is gram-negative. Mycoplasma has a different gram stain, and Streptococcus pyogenes is gram-positive. Question. Which toxin inhibits acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction? I'm sorry, but this one you just have to know cold. Botox is so popular and so frequently tested, you just have to know what it is. The answer is C, Clostridium botulinum toxin. Next question. A 28-year-old Peace Corps volunteer in South America suddenly develops fever, abdominal cramping, and a voluminous watery diarrhea. The diarrhea is non-bloody and contains small flecks that look like rice. On physical exam, she's tachycardic, she's got dry mucous membranes, decreased skin turgor, sunken eyes, and flat veins. They all reflect profound dehydration. The causative bacterium produces a toxin that... This question gives you a scenario of a watery, voluminous, rice water diarrhea. There are a couple of bacteria that can cause this syndrome. The fortunate thing is that in that table we looked at, the bottom half of these toxins cause diarrhea by increasing intracellular cyclic AMP. That's how you dysregulate the fluid and electrolyte balance. You cause the small bowel not to be able to absorb the water, and so it passes right through you. And that's how you get dehydrated and you can die. Next question. A farmer is working out in the fields mending fences when he punctures his finger on a rusty nail. He states that his last tetanus vaccine was 10 years ago. On physical exam, he's in no acute distress. The wound is shallow but dirty with minimal bleeding. The best course of action for this patient is to... We haven't really talked about this yet, but it's good to throw it in anywhere because questions about tetanus vaccine are rampant on USMLE, and so knowing what to do is important. When you have a patient with a mild wound that doesn't appear to be very infected and things seem to go very well, and they haven't had their tetanus vaccine in a long time, that's a good time when you administer a tetanus booster. When you have somebody who's never been exposed to tetanus, have never received their vaccination, and they have a bad wound that looks infected and it's going to set up shop, you need to consider tetanus, anti-tetanus immunoglobulin. There's not really a place for parental penicillin. Uh, and you, although you should clean and debride the wound, uh, that's not the only thing you're going to do. You're always going to give the booster. Next question. A one-year-old boy presents to the emergency room with difficulty breathing. His parents report that he has been suffering from a cold for about 10 days. He's got a runny nose, low-grade fevers, and a mild but persistent cough. Over the last two days, they report that the, co the cough has become more violent and prolonged to the point that he becomes cyanotic and unable to inspire. He has also started to vomit after these attacks. They also confess that he is not up to date on his vaccinations because they do not have access to medical care. The bacterium responsible for this illness encodes a toxin which... So as we evaluate this question, we have a multi-stage disease, which is only a finite number of things, and it's, it's to a bacterium or an agent that you, we usually are vaccinated against. So these two combined with we know that he's coughing gives us pertussis. He has whooping cough due to Bordetella pertussis. After that, we need to remember that Bordetella pertussis has a pertussis toxin, which increases intracellular cyclic AMP. These questions are hard, but you can see how memorizing which toxin comes from which bacteria and what it does can be high yield for step one. An 80-year-old female is being treated for a fractured hip when she develops a fever and an elevated white blood count. Blood and urine cultures are sent and she's started on empiric antibiotics. A chest x-ray is also obtained which is clear. She quickly becomes tachypnic, hypotensive, anuric, tachypnic, and confused. Blood and urine cultures return positive for E. coli. Which of the following is the endotoxin component responsible for inducing septic shock in this patient? So this one they practically give to us. They give us all of this clinical scenario, which is nice, but not necessary. Bottom line is we know that we have E. coli, which is a gram-negative bug, and we know it has endotoxin, and they just want to know which component which is responsible for the septic shock. So that is just a knowledge-based question. 
We know that it's lipid A. That's the part of endotoxin which causes this, the cascade which leads to septic shock. And that's something that we know. Let's wrap up Module 4 for Microbiology for Falcon Online Physician Reviews for USMLE Step 1. We talked about toxins, enterotoxins, endotoxins, and neurotoxins. You need to be familiar with each of them. It should be abundantly clear that endotoxin is LPS found on gram-negative bacteria. And also a frequent recurrent theme for enterotoxins are that they modulate cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP, most frequently to cause watery diarrhea. Up next, we're going to go to Module 5 where we're going to talk about infection control.